project Bijou is all about sharing stories to help drive cultural change regarding good data protection practices. With that in mind, Bermuda Privacy Commissioner Alex White joins me to share his data protection journey to discuss whether small jurisdictions can be global leaders in data protection and what keeps regulators awake at night. Hi Alex, how's it out in Bermuda? Hi Rachel, doing very well. Uh, I, we could always talk about the weather, but I try not to be the first person to bring up the weather because it tends to make other people feel bad. Yes, yes, we, yes, particularly today where we are. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you um, take some time out of your schedule uh, to assist us with the Bijou uh, project that we're, we're running um, and to provide your thoughts around um, data protection and the introduction of your um, legislation in, in the sunny island of Bermuda. I remember that we first spoke probably just over two years ago when I think you just about started in office um, at quite an interesting time. Um, how have you found it? Yeah, it, it's it was in the before times that yeah. we spoke uh, before all the before we were even used to doing video conferencing. Mm -hmm. So I think it was even just a regular old phone call uh, at, in those dark ages uh, before video conferencing became so prominent. Uh, yeah. But yes, it, it's been it's been a strange time for the whole world. Of course, mm -hmm. you know we've all had to readjust our priorities, uh, but it's also. I think shown how important the work we do is because you know it, it, in Bermuda this I'm not sure if this is the same uh, as you in Guernsey but in, in Bermuda there were not a lot of organizations with an online presence or with apps or with delivery services or things like that and mm -hmm. then we go into island-wide lockdown and suddenly everyone is trying to spin that up and trying to use data uh, in order to do it and so it's really showed the value of what we do and the, the framework we provide people. Yes, it has been. It's been a very interesting time. As, as you say, I don't think we were all necessarily prepared to, to shift entire workforces into, into home environments and the issues that that brings, uh, not least of which people keeping in contact with each other, but just keeping businesses going and finding new and novel ways of doing things. So yes, I think the, the challenges from a data perspective um, as well as um, thinking about just coronavirus track, track and trace and, um, has kept us all on our toes. Um, as a small team, of course, we, uh, we, we're not a, not a large organisation. We've had to think carefully about how we fulfil our statutory duties. And I recognise that the plan you may have had in January 2020 may not have been the same plan you ended up with by June. Um, but we've had to think of effective ways of, of working um, and trying to strike a balance um, between raising awareness um, and education of both organisations and individuals, um, and then looking at some of the other um, roles that we have, the new powers we have under our new law. Um, have you faced a similar um, dilemma and what's been your priority up to now? Yes, uh, we're. I think we're taking a similar approach to you because we're focusing very heavily on education and awareness. And in fact, our law right now is in a transition period. So uh, the investigations and uh, regulatory function is not really in effect yet. So we're even more lopsided and, and you know, we're, we're all perhaps almost 100% focused on education and awareness. Uh, but, but that's so important, especially in a community that did not have a strong precedent of data protection laws. The, the law in 2016 here in Bermuda, the Personal Information Protection Act, uh, was the first data protection law in the jurisdiction. Uh, and, and so there has been a lot of helping people understand, well, what does it mean to have a data protection program? What does it mean I'm supposed to do? And, and even why is this important at all? Uh, and so we, we talk about what are the privacy harms that can happen? And, and throughout all of these phases, we're always educating and helping people understand. I feel like once people understand, they see the value and they want to do it. And it's just a matter of helping show them something they may not have thought about before. Yes, I think so. Um, we have had data protection law for a, a lot longer than, than you have. Um, but interestingly, when our um, new law 
uh, came into effect at the same time as, as GDPR, so the glorious 25th of May 2018. Um, for a number of organisations and for individuals, it was as if this was a brand new thing that hadn't happened before. Um, so in some respects, even having a history of it, we've had to really look at uh, how we raise awareness. So I can appreciate um, uh, some of the challenges that that brings as to um, getting people to engage into why it's even even a thing and why it's something to be taken seriously. Um, so for over the last two years, obviously, you've done a lot of work around um, awareness. Um, what are the issues you're most um, concerned with or that have come up a lot over the over the time you've been at uh, the commissioner's office? Yeah, it, well, here's an example of, of how I think our jurisdictions are very similar, because I, I imagine this list will sound very familiar to you. And, and frankly, I've tried to steal uh, ODPA's materials whenever uh, it's relevant. Uh, but, but we deal, of course, with a lot of financial information. We have a lot of financial institutions, uh, particularly the reinsurance industry. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we we're dealing with those and helping people understand, well, how do you balance anti-money laundering regulations with the need to protect personal information and, and how that does not actually conflict and we can make it work together. Uh, and, and then talking about tourism industry and recreational businesses and, and using personal information for those purposes. Uh, and of course, universal issues like how do we deal with personal information that relates to children? What special protections might be needed uh, in the context of children or in the context of senior citizens who may not have an, an intuitive understanding of what the technology is doing and why? Yes, yes we've launched this year um a new program uh, with our uh, local youth commission uh, to reach more children to get into schools um, in a bigger way um, to uh, try and teach children um, using a bit of the um, pester power that they use so well um, to, to drive change with their parents um, but also so that they recognize the importance for themselves of, of the things that they do and the data that they have. Um, so uh, that's been quite interesting to see the change and of course at some point in 10 years or so they'll be joining the workforce and hopefully that will lead to a shift um, in the way um, organizations are working because the, the people coming in, the new staff will be asking the questions that maybe aren't being asked now. So we found that quite useful. Um, well, I'm quite been quite interested. I see you've got a mid-Atlantic compass, a privacy compass on your website um, and also your um, Latin motto, which you have, um, done some jiggle, jiggling with, um, which I, I was really quite pleased to see because I'm, I'm a bit of a Terry Pratchett fan and he does quite a bit with Latin in ways that um, probably Latin purists don't like. Uh, but I, I was quite interested in, in um, the sort of direction that you're taking things and, and um, what seems to be driving your organisations. I don't know if you could elaborate a little bit on that, please. Yeah, happy to. Thanks. And, and thank you for, for uh, mentioning the Latin motto. That's something I get a, a silly amount of uh, pleasure out of myself. Uh, and so, so Bermuda's motto is quo fata ferunt, which is whether the fates may take us. It's from Virgil's Aeneid. And it, it ties into the founding of Bermuda because Bermuda was founded by a shipwreck in 1609 uh, when the English first came here and said, hey, this is pretty great. Why don't, why don't we stay here? Uh, and, and so uh, I, I'd like to, to, to put a little tongue in cheek into that. And, and so we said, quote, data ferunt, uh, which is whether the data takes us. So that's where we need to follow from a regulatory perspective. We need to understand what we're doing with information and why, and we need to be willing to pursue it uh, in order to make sure that there's justice for individuals. Uh, and, and so in, in a similar way, I, I, I wrote this mid-Atlantic privacy compass, as I call it, um, it, it trying to think about uh, how we can balance the, the European model of uh, strong data rights with a North American model of regulatory engagement and interventions. And a lot of people think of those things as mutually exclusive, but I'm not convinced that's the case. Uh, and in fact, something I, I, I talk about all the time is that, you know, privacy means business. That's another mm -hmm. phrase we use a lot is, is how can privacy programs help organizations be more efficient and more profitable? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think the best thing we can do is show them the value 
of, of these things and how it makes dollars and cents for them to do it. Uh, and and so, so I joke that the Mid-Atlantic Privacy Compass was kind of like my plague, um, you know, King Lear, that King Shakespeare apparently wrote yes. King Lear during the plague. And so, so I, I, I wrote a lot of that during uh, to, uh, the, the COVID lockdowns. But the idea being, you know, what are the ideas we need to balance uh, in order to make this function uh, as a society? Uh, and so we've got the Compass Rose, and the different uh, main points uh, or the different cardinal directions. And there's lots of nautical puns, so I'll try not to spoil um, too many of them <laughs> for anyone who does want to take the time to read it. Um, but but it, generally the ideas are um, at a fundamental level in order to truly make sure that we are protecting personal information as a society and, and acting in ways that are appropriate for uh, for the, the general public good, we have to start thinking about ethics as a priority, as, as much of a priority as making a profit. Uh, and so how, how can we shift that? And, and how can we create incentives that help individuals uh, be encouraged to act either at an individual level or at an organizational level um, in a particular way? And uh, so, so some of the other points are about community and how we're all working together. It's not an adversarial relationship. We need to um, all chip in and we need to understand that people aren't perfect, that people are going to make mistakes and, and how can we, we move beyond them without thinking about it in a punitive way. Um, and, and one of my favorite points, I'll, I'll move on after this, but I just, I love this idea that um, we have to think also about regulation and guide rails as not being a limitation to innovation. You know, I, I love the example. Uh, there's a jazz pianist named Keith Jarrett, and he went. He was doing a concert in Germany. I think it was in the 70s, um, and he went, and the piano was broken, and so some of the keys were not working. Uh, and so he had to improvise while skipping over the keys that didn't work. Uh, and, and it ended up pushing him to do some very different things. And it ended up becoming a very famous conference or a very, very famous uh, concert for him. Uh, and, and so I think that, that we should take inspiration from that and mm -hmm. think, how can we use these guardrails to come up with win-win solutions? Yes, yes. I think all too often data protection ends up um, seemingly being a blocker and, and often that's not the case and it, it's not the intention that it's here to stop um, good ideas or innovation or anything like that um, but just to make sure that it's done in a way that that fosters the trust and confidence and trust being something else on your 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 compass I see so um, uh, it, that's that's all good to see um, so taking on board your the, the compass um, and the work that you're doing how's your regulated community responded so far um, as you set off on your enforcement journey or your, your um, regulatory journey. Yes, uh, well, and that's that's another pun I use. I say privacy is a journey, not a destination. Yes. <laughs> so we're, we're never going to get there. We're always going to be moving there. Yes, uh, it's but, never done. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and, and so generally, I would say my, my perception is that, that people seem to breathe the sigh of relief after we've had a chance to speak because they realize uh, that our goal uh, as an office is not punitive. You know, we're not coming in to throw our weight around and make headlines for how hard we can hit organizations with fines or things like that. You know, we want to be corrective and, and to help people uh, do the right thing and understand what the right thing is. Uh, and, and in fact, we did a community survey last year, uh, uh, the business community to, to you know, about their awareness of the law and what it means. And I was absolutely delighted because 100% of all respondents said that they thought uh, that the privacy law was a good thing for the community. Excellent. And 100%, I know that you can't beat that. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that was great. Uh, now, the problem was a much lower percentage said that they fully understand what it means they have to do at an organizational level. 
And that's where we get into the education and awareness component to things and, and helping people understand what it means they have to do uh, and, and how they can understand what the risks are uh, that they're trying to accomplish. Oh, you've cropped up in various places over the last couple of years with um, international work. So um, and looking at the list on your website of um, the different bodies you're a part of, um, you're obviously looking at um, international cooperation and cooperation between jurisdictions. Um, so um, how do you feel that, that can uh, benefit um, the, the community in Bermuda and the, the um, regulated uh, community as well as um, sort of privacy in general? Yeah, and, and I'll confess, I do have an interest in international and comparative law, so it, it's something I, I wanted to do in general, but also it makes a lot of sense for a small jurisdiction to get involved at the international level. Uh, you know, if an organization is founded in Bermuda or Guernsey or some other small jurisdiction uh, and they want to grow and expand, they, they're going to reach a point very quickly where the only way they can grow and expand is by extending into another jurisdiction. So we, they have a very strong interest in making sure that whatever we talk about is either consistent with or interoperable with what's happening in another jurisdiction. So we can at least speak the same language and you can say, okay, if Bermuda is X and, and Guernsey is Y, then X plus what equals Y, you know, what do you need to do to get there? Uh, and, and so we have to have those conversations and, and it can be good for organizations that can reduce their compliance costs. Uh, it can promote uh, consistency. Um, and, and from a, a totally selfish, practical perspective, it's good for me when I go to talk to organizations because they see that I'm not being unreasonable, that mm -hmm. I'm making the same requests that you're seeing elsewhere. Uh, and also as a new jurisdiction with a new law, it gives us an opportunity to kind of inherit the precedent of other places as well. Uh, and and I, I believe we should consider our colleagues around the world as as if nothing else, persuasive precedent, you know. Uh, so you know, just because uh, something is, a guidance is issued in another country doesn't necessarily mean it's irrelevant to, to us. You know, a best practice in Guernsey is probably going to be a best practice in Bermuda as well. So why reinvent the wheel? Uh, and, and so there's a lot of benefits from that perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's also good for individuals too. And I don't want to, to be solely focused on the business community because it, in, individuals have their rights protected at a higher level because it, it right, raises the, the level of around the world. You know, it makes sure that everything is consistent uh, around the world. And, and also, let's face it, a lot of the actors that we're going to run into online may not necessarily be based in your jurisdiction. So having the ability to engage with colleagues internationally who may have direct authority over them can help you protect individuals' rights. So if we were, uh, if I was to ask what keeps regulators awake at night, <laughs> is there anything in particular that springs to mind? Is there something that uh, is your is your nightmare or your um, <laughs> your big area of concern? Well, well, my joking answer is that in Bermuda we have very loud tree frogs that chirp all night long. Uh, but but the, the honest truth is after about a week, I was totally used to them and I actually really love listening to them while I lie in bed now. Uh, but but, the, uh, but in all seriousness, I, I think that, you know, one thing that everyone is going to struggle with, even the biggest regulators, uh, is the, the scale of the mandate. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're, we're given essentially a whole of society mandate uh, in, in a lot of cases. And that means a lot of different use cases for personal information. Uh, and, and there are principles that organizations have to follow, but it means that the organization itself has to look at what is doing, what it's doing in its mm -hmm. own context and make a judgment. Uh, and so while it might be tempted to, to, to use a biblical example to, to, for us to come down from the mountain and hand out stone tablets and say, here you go, just do this. Yes. Uh, that, that's not going to work in all search, search circumstances. Uh, and, and we're really better off if we can build something collaboratively with the community, because I don't like to assume that I know more than the community and I can just tell them what to do. Uh, and so the, the second uh, component I, I'd say is, is the speed 
of technological change. Uh, that's something that's incredibly difficult to stay on top of. And even if we put out guidance today on uh, a piece of technology, it could change or the application could change uh, tomorrow. Uh, and, and so, you know, we've got facial recognition technology on CCTV cameras. And now people are saying, oh, we can use this facial recognition technology to recognize people's emotions while they're talking or whether they're telling the truth or, what, or you know, whatever they claim to be able to analyze. Uh, and so now we have to think about it this whole other layer uh, or you know, people have been talking for a while about quantum computing. And, uh, and if, if quantum computing can accelerate computers to the extent that's claimed, it means that pretty much everything that's encrypted right now is going to be able to be decrypted very quickly. Uh, and, and so how do we think about that? And, and so that, that's really what I'm, I'm, I, what keeps me up is, is thinking about these new issues, you know, governments developing digital identity, uh, which can be, um, you know, a very privacy intrusive because suddenly someone's able to be individually identified everywhere you go. But there's also benefits if we can harness it right and, and we can put an individual in control of the data flows and they can see who is accessing their identity at any given time uh, so, so there's a lot of potential as well uh, but it's a lot to stay on top of it is yes i think um that's our um one of the things behind what we're looking at is is the breadth and, and the speed of change um, and of course both of our jurisdictions have some elements of industry that are very well regulated and have been regulated for a while and so um, a new area of regulation a new set of rules to comply with this is just that's another part of what we do in a day um, and then you've got the other other sectors of industry who haven't had to do anything like this before um, and and who do want the answers and 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 um, it's trying to uh, I think bring those areas of industry on board and saying, well, actually, you know the answers to these questions better than we do in some circumstances because you know they know their business. Uh, and it's never going to be that we can categorically um, provide them the answers that they want. Um, so it's almost skilling them up so they've got the trust and confidence in themselves to go off and, and find the answers. Um, but now I'm going to be sad that I don't have tree frogs keeping me awake at night. So. <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous. Um, well, you got to come visit. I will. Yes. No, we will have to. Um, and, and as I see, you're on the, um, the Global Privacy Alliance um, Executive Committee now. So um, that may be maybe sooner than I thought. Um, yes, um, we're we're very optimistic to host uh, uh, the, the global privacy community at some point in the future right here in Bermuda. So I, I hope that we'll be able to make a, a concrete announcement about uh, those sorts of things in the future, but not just yet. Yeah, no, that's, that's understandable. Um, and uh, I just want to say um, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's um, been very interesting to find out how um, another small jurisdiction is dealing with such a big, big global issue um, and starting from scratch as you have, um, you should be very proud. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. And, and I will, I'll say thank you for more than just having me speak because uh, the ODPA is a, an office that I have often looked to uh, for uh, ideas about how to approach different issues or as I said before, to sometimes uh, specific approaches or, or specific language may be suspiciously similar in our two jurisdictions. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for the work that you do and I hope you know that it's having an impact outside your shores. That's lovely, thank you very much. Bermuda and Guernsey are both small jurisdictions, but size is no barrier when it comes to our aspirations for setting the standard internationally for what good data protection practices should look like. There was, in fact, so much to discuss that we didn't have time to talk about their privacy, innovation and knowledge sharing, or pink sandbox, and the opportunities this provides for innovation. But perhaps that's a topic for another time. Mm -hmm.